Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Explore the Extraordinary podcast. My name is Betty Guadagno. Today, I am joined by Kathy McDaniel. I am such a huge fan of Kathy's story. She had a distressing near-death experience, and she shares about it so eloquently. And she's, um, yeah, part of the community with IONS. She actually runs, we have a distressing near-death experience or sharing group. Um, the second Thursday of every month. And I'll put the link in the description of this video in case you're interested in joining. Uh, if you've had an experience like that, it's a great place for support and understanding and just a beautiful sense of community. And um, yeah, I, Kathy's an author and I got so much going on. I'm just going to toss it right over to you, Kathy, so that you can introduce yourself and share your story with us. Thanks so much for being here. You're welcome. Well, uh, introduction. I had a distressing near-death experience um, right at the turn of the century. It was uh, somewhere around uh, December, January of 2000. Uh, my, my family said I was their own computer bug and I crashed right there at the turn of the century. I had um, been taking care of my best friend. Uh, who uh, all, all through the years, I'd known him for many years, we had been engaged for seven years, as a matter of fact, before he got transferred to the East Coast and we were living on the West Coast. And um, I had my business on the, you know, on the West Coast, my family and, and all that. So just, uh, we just decided it was best if we just you know, went our separate ways, but we stayed in touch. And uh, not long after he'd moved there, he gave me a phone call and said he needed to talk to me and he wanted to fly out. And I thought, hmm, fly out. But he did. And he had to tell me that he had leukemia. He was only 53. Uh, I had warned him. He didn't eat right, didn't sleep enough. He was just work, work, work. And uh, it took a toll. And so he says, well, uh, he had checked out several research hospitals and the best one was in Seattle. And uh, could I please come? He needed two caregivers or they wouldn't accept him into the program. I said, sure. So I had recently sold my business and was there, uh, therefore footloose and fancy free. So I flew up to Seattle. I had to find it on the map first. Uh, I, that's so funny. I had no idea. You know, you got California. That's all I knew for 23 years, five years I was there. So I thought, is it Washington, Oregon, Oregon, Washington? Anyway, I found my way there. Got us a place near the hospital. And uh, he brought out the second caregiver and uh, we were told, you know, I'll take about three, three months, maybe, maybe five at the most. And we had to learn how to clean a catheter and, and uh, sterilize the house every night. And I mean, it was a big deal. So he would go in for these treatments and then he would get better and then he'd get worse. And they, it was a research hospital. So I said, oh, well, we'll try this. You know, well, this went on and on. He'd get better and he'd get worse. And um, we were all getting kind of tired. It was a lot of work. It was around the clock. I mean, many times we'd get up in the middle of the night, he started bleeding and we had to had this routine where I'd run to this dark underground parking garage at three o'clock in the morning and, and race out in front. She'd shove him in the car. We'd zoom over there and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he died. And it was like, what? It, it just was just so surreal. I was exhausted. Uh, I was hanging around till my lease expired and I was going to go back to California. A friend of mine um, that I had met in Seattle asked me if I wanted to go to a concert in Southern California. I said, sure. And, and I caught this hideous flu that was going around very similar to the COVID thing. Uh, it went from flu, pneumonia, uh, ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, just lung failure, in a matter of days. Uh, he he saved my life uh, one time. I mean, I called him up in the it was middle of the night and I said, I'm, I'm coughing up blood. I need, I can't get down this three flights of stairs in my apartment building with no elevator to get back to the dock in the box. I saw this at he was Zoom. He picked me up took me down there. By the time I tried to get out of the car, I could feel my life force just running out of my body. And I felt like I was shouting, but he said, you were whispering, I'm dying, I'm dying. So I blacked out. 
He picked me up, carried me inside, no pulse. They get an ambulance, take me to the hospital. I wake up a couple of days later in this oxygen tent. And here's my parents, my daughter. They all live in different states. And I thought, what's going on? And they said, well, you're really sick. And uh, you've got something called ARDS. The doctor said, you got about a 38% chance of making it. We really don't know how to treat this. So we're going to put you into a coma and everybody cross your fingers, you know? And I was like, all right. I had no no real say in the thing. I mean, it was that or die. So the doctor's last words to me were, we're going to give you something while you're in the coma. You will be, your brain will be offline. You will be unable to remember anything that happens to you. Okay. So you're just going to go blank. Okay. And hopefully we'll wake you up. What could I say? It was, it was New Year's Eve, 1999. Last thing I remember is the ball going down at Times Square. Okay. So, uh uh-oh, I'm awake. And I'm thinking, what the heck? Uh, It's perfectly dark. There's no sound. I have no idea if I'm standing or sitting or whatever. I'm just here. I thought, well, there's nothing to do. I'll just kind of hang out and see what happens. So it started to get lighter. And I thought, okay, uh, good. Light is good. And it was kind of a reddish glow. And I thought, sun's coming up. I don't know. And it got more and more foggy looking and uh, swirly kind of stuff. And I thought, that's strange. And then I started uh, feeling a little warm in here and something horrible was smelling. I thought, what is that? And then I started hearing these shrieks and moans. I thought, this can't be good. And all of a sudden, it scared me half to death. This voice just boomed out of the fog and said, you know where you are. And I said, uh, hell. And this voice just boomed back, Whoa, just like in a monster movie, freaked me out. I just remember turning to the left and running. I thought, I don't care if I drop into a hole or run into a wall, I got to get away from that thing. So now it's pitch dark again. I'm standing in the dark, afraid to move again. And boom, these lights come on. And I, I kind of looked and I thought, where in the heck am I? And it looked like New York City. And after somebody had bombed it all out, all these buildings are falling over. The windows are blown out. There's rebar and concrete, big chunks of it. And I'm thinking, what is this? You know, and I could hear people screaming and and, uh, sirens and and all kinds of chaos. And I thought, I'm standing out here in the middle of a, a street with all this stuff around me. I better tuck away and you know, I'll get my 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 uh, bearings. So I kind of s- squeaked over under a piece of concrete and was eyeballing everything. And then I heard weird noises like a machine that like was scratching the rocks going by. And I thought, oh, that was an alien invasion. Maybe that's what happened. Again, completely freaked out. So there's creatures, people wandering around, you know, and they, they were kind of scary. And other things happened. It was just, I was there quite a while. And finally, I decided I got to get out of here because this is nuts. And I need to find someplace quiet, maybe find some food or something. So I, I saw a wall. I thought, well, if I can just get up that wall. So I went screaming across the jumping over, you know, rocks and stuff and, and, and climbed up this wall while I got almost to the top and my fingernails are scratching and I fell backwards. And I thought, oh, this is going to hurt. And the lights went out. Then the lights came up. And I was some place, someplace completely different. And I thought, now what? So this went on a couple of times. I'll skip to one of my favorites was uh, the lights came up and I'm looking at something in front of me that's obviously quite large. So I, I kind of looked up and it's like, the only word that came to my mind was demon. This is a demon. This is what one looks like. And I thought, I'm just going to stand here because I don't know what to do. And he said, do you want to get out of here? Gee, that was perfect English. And I says, yes, I do. And he says, well, you you take care of something for me and I'll see you get out. And I said, uh-huh. And again, you're there. You, you got to make do. So I said, what do you need? And he says, I need you to, and he raises his hand 
And as far as you can see is all these big, huge blackberry canes are all wrapped around each other, just miles of them. And uh, I don't know about you, but in Washington, we know what that means. They're very difficult to get rid of. So he says, I just need you to cut these down for me and then I'll see you to get out. And I thought, what? And I said, sure, I'll play along. I thought if I just play along, maybe the guy will turn his back. I can you know, find someplace else to run to. So he gave me these little paper kid cutting scissors they give kidney gardeners and says, there you go. And then he laughed. And I thought, oh, what a jerk. He, I knew he was playing with me, but I thought, okay, I got no, no place else to go. So I scritch down, I'm getting all scratched up and I start gnawing away at one of these canes. And finally I got the thing to cut off. And so I went to put it behind me and then I turned back around. And when I did, the thing grew all the way back the way it was. And I looked up at this guy and, oh, he's belly laughing. He thinks this is so funny. And I thought, you, I'll show you. I, again, got no place else to go. I'll just keep cutting. So when I went down to cut again, the lights, lights came up. Um, different scenarios. Uh, in between, I found myself on this road. It uh, Road is probably a, a little bit too sophisticated for what it really was. It was like a dirt path, but it was obvious that people, some, or something was walking on it occasionally. So it went to the left and the right as far as I could see. And, you know, feeling like I was still in traffic, I turned to the right and, and, and got on the road. There was a horizon way, way, way off in the distance. And they, they had this reddish glow, like maybe there was a fire down there or something, you know, no stars, no moon, no watch. I had no idea where I was, what time it was. Um, I just knew I had to keep moving and try and find a way out, you know, uh, this fella had laughed, the last fella had said to me, Demon, uh, just despair, you're not getting out of here, this, you're just not, and I thought, no, 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 I don't, I don't give up, I'm, I'm a survivor, so I'm plotting things while I'm on this road, and I occasionally ran into situations there, uh, one was running into living people, I'm one of the few people I know that's seen living people. There's a, a gal named Emily who's doing a book on that right now. But I saw somebody that I knew, a relative, a live relative, who I was very close to, younger than I. And she was futzing around and making this feast of food. Before I got there, I had smelled it. And I thought, again, I had no idea I was dead. I could smell. I was hungry. I was tired. I was scared. It was just weird. Uh so I got up to her and she was making this big banquet, all this fancy food all around. And I said her name and she looked at me like, who are you? And I said, I am so hungry. I was a little thirsty and I'm so tired. Could you get me just a little plate? Anything would be great. A glass of water. I'll be on my way. And she looked at me and says, well, this is for the important people. Whoa, that hurt. I said, sorry to bother you. So I got back on the road. Trying to think which one will I throw at you next. Uh, the, some of them I just really don't like to talk about when I'm not certain of my audience. Uh, they're pretty bad. I mean, hell is not a pretty place. And so there was jobs that, that they wanted me to do that I found immoral, disgusting. Um, I, I just wouldn't do it. And every time I would say I'm not going to do it, there would be a club or something raised as if to hit me and they would say, you have no idea what you're doing. Every time you do this, it's gonna get worse. And, and they reached up there to hit me and I just closed my eyes, the lights would go out and they were right. I'd come up someplace even worse. Kept going. Towards the end, I did not know this at the time, but I was on the road. I was tired. I was starting to think this might not end well. Uh, I had found nobody that could help me. Uh, even finding someone I knew wouldn't help me. So I was a little down. Um, I'm walking on the road and up ahead of me, I see what appears to be maybe people. It's always dim there. There's no sun or there's, that's not enough, not enough light, just enough to you know, to be spooky. And so I saw these people walking back and forth across my road, you know, and I thought I can't get off this road. 
because I don't know where I'll end up. At least the road may go someplace, someplace out. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to go through that crowd. There's probably 20 of them. And as I got closer, I could tell they kind of had ratty clothes on and they were like muttering to themselves. And some of them were limping. And I thought, ah, geez, this isn't going to be good. And I thought, well, maybe if I just, you know, limp, mutter, uh, keep my eyes down and just kind of meander through them, they won't notice and I'll get to the other side of the road. So that was my plan. I'm muttering and I'm stumbling and I get to the middle of the, of the group and they all freeze. And I thought, expletive. And I froze. And then slowly I could see out of the corners of my eyes, some of the people were moving to the outside. They appeared to be the rags that they wore were like long and things around their head. Now, those probably the females Therefore, the males were kind of going around me. And I could see them now. They looked like they had leprosy uh, or something. The skin was rotting. Uh, they were not healthy. They looked like zombies. I, I, I thought, you know, what? So they start closing in on me. One hits me in the chest, knocks me backwards. Another one kicks me, knocks me down. And it was about 10 of them did what? Zombies would do to a single woman all by herself. And it was a very unpleasant, frightening, terrible experience. And they finally leaned back, one leaned back again to me, and I can still see his face. He looked at me and his cheek was falling off. And he said, we all have AIDS and now you do too. And you will get sicker and sicker and look like us, but you can't die. And he backed up. And I sat there and I put my rags around me and I thought, now what? Now what? I'm I'm getting tired. This is this is not getting any better. I don't know. And this woman demon came and got through the crowd and she says, you, you're with us. Come on, get up. And and at least it was a female demon. And I got up with not a better suggestion. And there were, she led me to this other group of, I don't know, eight and nine other women that obviously had been through the same experience I had. And she said, uh, follow me and get in line. So we did. I mean, there's very little strength left at this point. And um, we came out of the woods and as we did, as far as I could see was like Alaska tundra. It was snow and, and wind. And uh, we kind of looked at each other and she said, follow me. And we got behind her and it started to snow. Now you got, you got rags, you know, you're wearing and that's not very warm. And so we're walking behind her and for a very long time, it starts to snow. The wind is blowing. All I know is when we started walking, it was on the ground. And we walked and at one point I, I did this like out of body thing where I looked down and I could see us all in the snow walking in a, in, a, in a line as far as you could see back where we had come from and nothing in front of us except snow. And at this point, the snow is chest high. So it's it's been a while that we are freezing and walking through the snow. Finally, she gets to this rundown cabin thing uh, and says, okay, we're here and opens this ratty door and we file inside and there's no insulation. There's no windows, a glass in the windows. It's cold and she said, sit down. We're all sitting down, kind of huddled one another. And she says, now we wait for customers. And I thought, how is this gonna get any worse? I was getting very tired, kind of running out of hope. And um, I asked her, you know, I, she, I said, hey, you know, I've been here a long time. This seems like a particularly heavy, nasty day. Is there something I don't know? She says, well, 
it's Christmas on earth today. That's always the worst day in hell. Well, uh, I was trying to kind of skirt around that. And I thought, okay, this is really not good. And I thought, well, um, again, I thought, I'm not going to take this sitting down. So I started singing a Christmas carol. I thought that'll really tick her off. You know, I'm miserable. She might as well be miserable. I'm just not going to take this sitting down. And so away in a manger is what I started singing, my favorite. Away in a manger. And she turned around, shut up. No crib for his bed. And now the other ladies are singing. She's yelling at them and kicking at them. And I kept singing. The little Lord, and she shrieked and jumped at me, and I closed my eyes, and the lights went up, and the lights came up, and I was completely filled with this joy and love and bliss. It was like tumbling and swimming in love was all I could, I could, I could equate it to. It was just marvelous. I had no recollection of anything that had ever happened before. I was just in bliss. And as I enjoyed the sensation, uh, it started to kind of not be perfectly light anymore. It was kind of, I, I could see it settle down or something. And it looked like maybe the inside of a cathedral, big, maybe a white marble cathedral. It was just gorgeous. There was no pictures or anything like that. That was just the sensation I had. It was just holy. <laughs> And um, as I'm looking around, oh my gosh, I see my friend who just died the month before, the one that had leukemia, and he looked great. And I thought, what? I mean, the last time I saw him, I mean, uh, he was all blotchy and his hair fell out. And I thought, good grief, he looks like he's about 35, you know? His hair wasn't gray and he was wearing a sweater that I gave him, and he was laughing and just dancing. He was so excited. And I thought, oh, he doesn't know he's dead. And I thought, I don't want to be the one to tell him. And then he starts really laughing. And I thought, no, I didn't say that out loud. How did he? Oh, my gosh, it's dawning on me. He's dead. I must be dead. This is certainly heaven. And it doesn't get any better than this. And I, I just, in my mind says, what are we doing standing here, man? Let's go see stuff, you know? And out of the corner of my eye, I kind of saw this, it was like an architect's table with a great big, huge book on it. It was about halfway open. And I thought he was showing me something in that book. What was it? Oh, never mind. And so as I started to try and get a hold of him, he said he got close, but he wouldn't let me touch him. It's now Mary Kay. That's what he called me. You've got too much left to do. What? <laughs> Thing, the light went on. I says, no. Yeah, no. And I stomped my foot. I crossed my arms. He's laughing. I'm saying, no. Lights went out. <laughs> the lights came up. I'm pretty sure now in retrospect, I, I went to a timeout room, you know, like bad children because I was really angry. So I was in this lovely field, you know, and there was a beautiful burbling stream and it went downhill and I kind of walked down this stream and, and it was, you know, kind of accepting what was going on. And uh, I met three different ladies. They had a, a message I had to give to this boyfriend of mine. And I thought, okay, okay. So then the lights went out. And the lights came up. Whoa, they're way too bright. What's going on? And there's these bodies, these people moving around. I thought, oh, no, I'm back in hell. And one of them turned around and says, mom's back. It's my daughter. And then my mother turns around, my dad. And they all come running over. Well, you know, it was way too much you know, for all these people, they're all talking at once. And then I thought, why can't I move? I can't move. I can't talk. What's going on? What's going on? I couldn't say anything. 
my daughter said, now, mom, you've been really, really sick. We thought we lost you. You made it back. My mother says, oh, we had a prayer circle, Kathy, going around the globe and we brought you back. And I thought, if I could get my hands on you, I would not be kind. I thought it was really good that I could not talk because I would have been quite rude. So I just, I just, again, had this deer in the headlights look. I just kept looking from eye to eye and, and nothing made sense. It turned out the next day the doctor came through and he's, you know, checking what, what I can do and what I can't do. And they decided, well, she can move this finger and blank. You know, that was the good news. And I had that thing in my throat, so I couldn't talk. And they said, it's, it's going to be a bit of a rehab for you, mom. Um, you're 86 pounds and uh, that's why you can't move. You've got no muscle mass or muscle memory left, but we'll work on that. You know, and I thought, this is echoing in my head. You've got too much left to do, you know? How in the hell am I supposed to do something if I can't even breathe? You know, I was angry, very, very angry. Plus I kept, I couldn't go to sleep because I was afraid those freaking demons were gonna come back again. It was a mess. So anyway, um, I stayed there in ICU for four weeks. And then I went to a, uh, physical rehab facility for a month and I had to learn how to walk and talk and crawl and button and swallow and all those things and my insurance company gave me a month and then if I didn't do it by then they'd throw me in a convalescent hospital or whatever and I'd die so I had to really I had um I had to do it and I did and I was still not happy especially about not being back uh about being back so anyway, the, the 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 kind man that I uh, you know had saved my life, who I was supposed to give the the message to, was we had to live together. And he was Lutheran, and he says I can't just live together; we'll have to get married. And I I thought, okay, we've known each other what five months, maybe you know, uh, sure, because the doctor says you can go live with your parents or get married because you can't live by yourself. Well, I was 53 and it didn't look like much of a choice. He was a nice guy, you know? So anyway, that's, that's how I got through there. Nobody wanted to hear my story. I tried to tell them I was in hell and then I was in heaven. And, and uh, why were you in hell? My mother says, what did you do, Kathy, to go to hell? It's like, mm -hmm. I can't come up with a good answer. I'll I'll not tell people about that part anymore. And then it was like, it was your the drugs. It was, you know, the coma. It, it wasn't real. You'll get over it. So it took me a very long time, a year, to recover back to where I was with really hard work. And then it took me 10 years to find IONS through a series of synchronicities. Now that I know now I planned well <laughs> before I was... Uh, coming down here, it was my escape route, but I finally got to Ions. It was a little disappointing to go to the meetings and have the speakers say, oh, I saw Jesus and we had lunch and, and I did this with the Holy Spirit and we, you know, I saw all my, and I'm thinking, hmm, that's not quite what I had. I, I, I feel a little fish out of water here. And so luckily Greg, uh, he's one of the hotshots up there, says, uh, I was walking out a little early at a meeting and he says, where are you going? And I says, I don't belong here. And he says, why? And I says, I did not have that experience. And he says, I'd love to hear about it. We don't get these, you know, distressing ones very often. It's a treat. And I thought for whom is this a treat? You know, I don't even like to talk about these. He says, uh, I'll call you. And I says, fine. So he did. And it was uh, just a, like a week before Christmas. I was getting a divorce because my husband thought, you know, you're never going to go back to being you again. This is this is too distressing. Uh, it was not a good time, but he called and I couldn't get him off the phone. And he made me tell the story. And that's when he says, wow, on a Grayson scale, you, you know, you got a you got an A. And I thought, huh? And and so he explained all this to me. He says, you've got to come up. You've got to talk about this. We, we, we need to hear about these things. Well, I put him off for several months. But he was insistent. And finally, I got up there. More synchronicities prompted me. I 
pushed is the word, not prompt. But I got up there with Kimberly, God love her. And uh, we had, it took an instant dislike to each other. It was great. We're very close now, but she kept telling me, oh, honey, you'll be fine. Here's a Kleenex. I thought, I can do this myself. You know, I mean, it was just hysterical. So I thought, okay, I'll make a total fool of myself. I'll tell these people what I experienced and then they will show me the door. So I started talking and I told the story and I'm looking out there and I it was the place was packed and they, you know, you know, somebody's gone to hell. This sounds this great fun. Let's come. So I'm telling this story and I'm looking out on the crowd and they're like bug eyed, right? There's there's you could hear a pin drop in that place when I'm walking through hell. And I thought, well, this is kind of fun. I mean, I'm a storyteller. So I thought I'll just give them the whole Mazzola here and see what they do with it. So we get all the way to the end. We're all sitting in the hut, you know, this demon lady is being a real creep. And, um, I, 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 you know, I, I, I told her what I told her and then boom, we're in heaven. You know, the, the big relief, there's clapping, uh, you know, everybody's thank God. And then by the end, you know, it was just great. And I thought, wow, that was interesting. I feel better, you know, that, that I wasn't stoned and thrown out of the building. So maybe, maybe there's a purpose here. And uh, it evolved. It evolved. Uh, that was probably 13 years ago. And uh, finally, it came to the point where I understood my mission was to come back and tell people, you know, God is all loving. God is all forgiving, and he would never condemn anybody. If your religion, your culture, your family tell you that if you do this, you're going to hell, that you're going to hell. If you don't do this, you're going to hell. Excuse my language. It's bullshit. That is not true. I'm here to explain to people that... People like myself, who are, I was a Catholic, I was told from day one, uh, for, you know, first grade, whatever, you know, that all about the religion and you had to, you know, have Jesus as your savior and, and that you have original sin on you and that Jesus died for your sins, but you can still go to hell if you eat meat on Friday, if you talk nasty to sister, if you, all these other things, wait a minute. There's indulgences. If you say a rosary, then you get 600 days off your time in purgatory because Kathy will be going to purgatory. I mean, Mother Teresa, St. Francis, they go straight shot, but the rest of us are going to go to purgatory. Kathy, it's just like hell, but you get out. Okay? That's the rules. I believed that my whole life. I did lots of novenas, lots of rosaries. I tried to get my bank all piled up with stuff so I could use it to pay off my days in purgatory, but I miscalculated somewhere. So it was only because I manifested my own. This is my experience and this is what I think. And from talking to other people, you know, I know you get the life review and that's not a bad thing. That's, you just get to see your whole life and how you did because earth is school. We, we all start off in heaven. That's the, the heaven expat thing. We, we're expatriates of heaven. We come down, we do our work our, on earth, and then we go home. It's the heaven expat. So don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, the worst thing about a, a life review, I understand, is that you get to feel how it felt to interact with you. So if you, you, know, you picked on somebody, you were mean or something, you get to feel how that, oh, that didn't feel so good. You feel that. Or if you were really kind to somebody, you feel that joy and you see the, the ripples effect, you know, the pebbles in the water thing. If if you did something wonderful and good, that goes down the that goes down the line, too. So that's kind of the story and hopefully the message. Skip the trip. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you for your vulnerability, for sharing. And, you know, for me. Hearing the the integration, hearing the wisdom and the message that's come out of your experience, 
is so powerful. I, yes, I have affirmed you many times in the past. I really love what you have to say because when I hear your story, I hear my thoughts shape my reality. So, you know, your journey into hell sounds a lot like what my life, my human life was like before my spiritual awakening. And I realize now that even in my human life, my thoughts were creating that lack experience. And, you know, we don't have to die to come to this realization. That's the beautiful thing about spiritual experiencers is that we've come back with some information. So I'm curious, how, what, do, what do you do now to sort of like keep your thoughts like high vib high vibration for lack of a better term but you know how, how do you keep yourself grounded i think sense of humor uh lighten up people this is not this is not a, this is not real <laughs> you know this is all an illusion and we're playing you know we, we've wrote the, the the script for our play we're playing it out it's a role and when things get sticky i think okay i planned this you know what am i supposed to learn uh, if something doesn't go my way, I say, so what, you know, in, in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, I love that I'm not a victim anymore. Um, you know, I, I, why God are you doing this to me? Well, no, 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 Kathy, you planned this. So you, you lose a lot of the stress of being here just by realizing, um, you chose it. It's temporary and you're going to go home and everything's going to be great. Ah, uh, yes. Oh my God. I love that. Yes. Breaking out of the victim mentality has been so, so big for me as well. And, you know, like when I talk to people about pre-birth planning, which is a big part of my own spiritual experience, I get met with so much resistance, you know, like, <laughs> well, that can't be true because why would somebody pick to live a life like this? Or why would a baby die or this or that? And, you know, there's so, of course, there's so many experiences that as a human, you look at it and you say, no way, nobody would ever pick that but as a soul you might have a different perspective on why we pick things like the way that we pick them so yeah, yeah. do you, yeah so how did the information of pre-birth planning come to you was it something that you realized in your experience was it some sort of literature that you found afterward I love ions I've been here you know 10 12 years and listening to different people and I, I feel like when you know whew, eternity and God is so huge you know no no human mind can wrap around that and so I feel like when we have these experiences we come back with this little puzzle piece you know and we, we're putting this little puzzle together and everybody's got a different piece and so uh I feel like I can look at the puzzle and say oh wow I didn't know about that but I accept it and you know, you get that sense of, of what is rings true with you and what somebody might have made up. I mean, you get that thing that happens. Uh, uh, I love that. I love that thing, you know, where you could kind of uh, bullshit meter or whatever you want to call that, that, that it helps you get through life uh, a lot better. And, and it, you just, you can say to somebody, if they're giving you that line, you just say, really? Oh, you believe that? Okay. And you don't have to talk anybody out of anything. Um, They'll accept it or they won't. That's it. I love that too. Yes. I'd like for me, I'm not here to teach or preach or proselytize. That's not it. You know, like I am a shining example of the fact that there is transformation. Um, and I think that you are too. So on that note, do you still subscribe to organized religion? Have you, have you kind of, um, yeah, like gone away a bit? Talk about that. I, 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 I still will go to mass with my mom. You know, she's 96 and it upsets her. Um, but no, I, I, me and God laugh when the prayers are saying, you know, and, it, you know, it's I, the just little simple things like in the resurrection of the dead, you know, and it's like, uh, spoiler alert, there's no bodies in heaven, people, <laughs> you know, but, but again, I, I get this sense of God saying it's cool. You know, these people are doing fine with that. You weren't, you're being a sport to go with your mom. It's all good, you know? So I don't, I, I know religion for me, there's too many man-made rules. But again, I don't want to take that away from somebody if that's their comfort. Mm, I love Or that. that's their path. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because that's true, too. It is the path for some people. Some people have signed up to be part of that for the for their lifetime, you know, like there's just so many options of things. And I really loved in, in your experience how things shifted 
with just like closing your eyes. And when I hear that, you know, I also think about how many options of things we have here that like every decision that we make for me, anyway, I believe that like we're fracturing into a different, a different mm. timeline, a different dimension, like every decision can, can lead us to something else. You know, like, as I was listening to your experience, I was thinking like, wow, this sounds like a dream. Did it feel that way for you? Did it feel like a dream? Ooh, no, no, it was not a dream. And, um, it, it was, I can't remember what I dreamt last night. This happened 24 years ago, but, but I did, I did come to the conclusion that I made my own hell out of things that actually happened in my life. And that's why they were segmented because I've talked to several other people that had the same thing. It was like scenes, you know, and I like that first one uh, in the bombed out city. I mean, in 1989, I was in Santa Cruz under my desk when that eight points, no, a 7.8, whatever the hell, let earthquake leveled our town, people screaming and all that, you know, so that was that one. And then I could say, okay, this, oh my God, that that's when this happened. I just made it bigger, but yeah, I created it. Wow. 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 I just read a book, like it was a fiction book, but I just read a book that, and it's so much of what you're saying. And, you know, I really feel like writers are philosophers, you know, like they're making it digestible for the collective, mm -hmm. but you know, these are real experiences that can happen. And yeah, you know, even in my human life, like one thing from childhood, one sort of trauma re-manifests over and over and over again in my adult life until I decide to take a look at it and heal it, you know? So and that's what I'm getting from your story too, you know? And, and I think that it's so transferable, like the spiritual experience that you had versus what, you know, uh, this spiritual experience that I'm having in my human life here, um, it's, it's all thought centered. Everything is so centered around what we're thinking, what we're feeding ourselves with. Um, is there any sort of literature that really calls to you now um no <laughs> <laughs> i i read a lot of stuff oh i will take that back uh there was a, a book that i read uh the new history of early christianity it's about that thick and it's heavy duty but it told told me it told me all about how the bible came and the stories of jesus and all that stuff so that it you know, because I knew things, but this explained how I knew it. You know, I, I intuited a lot of the, the things that happened about the metaphors and, and all of that stuff. So that was very helpful for me to, personally to be able to let go of the Bible. Wow. Yes, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm definitely going to check that out. I love when people are able to sort of craft things around how, how it all began, you know, how, how did this all get so jumbled and misconstrued? I really love being able to uncover. You'd like that one then. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. So yeah, I just, I wanted to ask a little bit about service. I mentioned that you do service for IONS and, you know, carrying out your mission, writing your book and yeah. Like, so what does it feel like for you to be of service today? Do you have people reach out? I know that you do tons of interviews. So do you have people? <laughs> yeah, I've done lots more? of podcasts. Yeah. Um, I've been asked to uh, with my book, my book has been my entree into things, you know, there's been a couple of, uh, uh, retirement homes I've been asked to come talk to, you know, they're kind of, kind of on their mind a little bit more than most of us. Um, so that's been fun. Uh, I do ministry every day, uh, you know, on the airplane or whatever, or that the guy who's driving me to the airport in the limousine, I talk to people and they go, when the, the tell is when they say, I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't run into you today. You know, I really needed the answer to this question. Oh my God, what, write, your, write your name down. I want to look you up. You know, so every place I go, there's people that, you know, we agreed years ago <laughs> to meet up. And um, so it, it just comes down and finds me. What was I have to leave the house most of the time, you know, right. you know <laughs> not knocking on the door, but uh, yeah, but through the podcast really a lot there. I've had almost, uh, I stopped counting, but I think a million views. Oh, wow. You know, this little girl in Gig Harbor that hardly ever leaves, you know, golly gee, uh, it's, you know, spirit finds a way. I, I, I guess I knew about the internet when I was up there and 
said, I'm going to do that. And you, like with you, you know, same thing. You're, you're, who who would have thought, you know, 20, 40 years ago, you'd be a podcast host. My gosh. Never. You couldn't even tell me four <laughs> years ago, I would be doing anything <laughs> like this. Never, ever. So yeah, I, I love the, being able to get the message out, you know, like all this information that you have, not only from your own experience, but from what you've learned and, and having a platform to do that. And um, I just, yeah, I want to do a little bit of promotion, um, you know, whether you're, if you're watching this in the recent time, or we could be watching it years from now, who knows, but uh, we're having an IONS conference in Washington, D.C. this year, which is 2023. It's weird <laughs> to think that somebody could watch this like five years from and now. And they'll go, oh my gosh, it was 2023. Right, right. <laughs> they had gas powered cars. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. Um, and yeah, Kathy's going to be doing a workshop. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about what the conception is? We don't know, know what it's going to look like. Yeah, just it's basically the, uh, losing the, the fear and shame of having a distressing near-death experience. I mean, it's bad enough to come back from um, a, a positive experience because that's post-traumatic stress right there going from heaven to here. That sucks, you know, but if you've also been to hell, folks, I mean, <laughs> we need a break. So a lot of people don't talk be about it because of the fear and the shame. So I want to address that by asking these people to just come and share their stories with one another and 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 what we've learned about what that meant that that it's in all likelihood you plan that that takes a lot of it out of it and something good will happen from it and 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 give them you know give them some hope and self esteem and relief uh, of just. It's okay. It's okay that this happened. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Oh, I love that. So something else that you mentioned, and then I think we'll start wrapping up, but you know, obviously you have found your purpose. It sounds like your purpose aligned. You can tell how lit up you are sharing your experience. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, what would you say for somebody who's, who's reaching for their purpose, who's searching for it? What kind of tools would you offer them on how to find it? I feel like you're drawn to whatever it is you're supposed to. So if you keep being drawn to, to these videos, this type of video or uh, uh, any of anything spiritual like that, if you're, if you find that it's fascinating or, or interesting or whatever, that's a clue. And to be open to that, to be actively seeking and asking for, you know, help me find, find what I am I'm supposed to do. So the last thing I would like to leave people is, when I got back, it had been several years and I I still was afraid of the demons, you know? And I said to God, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna do any more thou shalt not. Give me something positive I can do every day that will remind me and keep me on the right road. And my mind was still pretty foggy from all that stuff. I, for a long time, I had trouble with my memory. So he gave it to me two words at a time. And over a series of months, it came, be loving, kind, merciful, forgiving, encouraging, grateful, non-judgmental, and useful. And useful is the purpose thing. So that's kind of my mantra and what I share with you. That is beautiful. I can't think of a better way to end it. And I love the calmness in like, yeah, the quote from God, like it just sounds so definitive and just so purposeful, you know, like that. So beautiful. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your well, Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. yes. You're doing a great job. Oh, thank you so <laughs> much. I'm so grateful to serve and I'm so grateful to connect with you today. Thank you so much for being here. Bye-bye. See you next time. Be wavy.